Thanks to start. You're welcome to the Governance and Strategic Planning Committee um, today. So I'm going to pass to John for the notice summons meeting and the roll call. And thank you, Chair, and good afternoon, members. Um, to all members of the Governance and Strategic Planning Committee, you're hereby summoned to attend the monthly meeting of the committee, which will be a hybrid meeting to be conducted remotely via WebEx and physically here in the Council Chamber, Tuesday, 28th November at 4 o'clock. Alderman Cook. Online, John. Alderman Hussey. Alderman Wilkinson. Councillor Boggs. He's online. Okay. He's online. He's online. Gary Donnelly. Okay. Councillor Sandra Duffy. Councillor Farrell. Here. Councillor Harkin. Councillor Heaney. Good shot. Councillor Jackson. Good shot. Councillor McGinley. Good shot. Councillor Mooney. Councillor O'Farrell and Councillor Thank, Thank you. And Councillor Tierney. Thank you. Thank you, John. Um, item three is our broadcasting statement. I would like to remind everyone present at this meeting in the Guild Hall or in attendance remotely at this meeting that this meeting will be broadcast live to the internet and will be capable of repeated viewing. This broadcast may be terminated or suspended in accordance with our protocol. Due to your attendance at this meeting, you are consenting to be informed under the use and storage of those images for broadcasting and training purposes and for the purpose of keeping historical records and making those records available to the public. Members and approved speakers are reminded to only have their mics and cameras on while speaking at the meeting and to use the chat facility to highlight a request to speak. A copy of the Council's privacy notice may be found on the Council website. Item four is declarations of members' interests. Um, they can be um, declared now. Go ahead, Councillor Jackson. Um, can I declare an interest on item 11? Um, it's an appointment to councillors um, on the board of the Port of Harbour. Um, I, uh, so I just declare that interest as a current commissioner. And in item 12, under correspondence, there's correspondence in relation to the recruitment of independent members of the PCSP. Um, I am currently um, a member of the PCSP as the council. So, Declare an interest on that. Thanks. Thank you, Councillor Jackson. Okay. So, if anybody else has any declarations of interest throughout the meeting, you can just raise them at, at the stage that we get to those items. So, that'll move us forward. Item five um, is our first deputation of today, and it's to receive Mr. Liam Kelly, who's the chairman of the Police Federation, to discuss the impact of the proposed reductions to police officer numbers and the police civilian staff. As per the motion agreed on the 26th of January, full council. Um, Liam's joining us online, as far as I'm aware. Um, so, Liam, normally what we would do is to pass over to yourself for your presentation, and then we'll open it to the floor um, for members for any questions or comments. So, I'll pass over to yourself. Uh, good afternoon. Can you hear me okay? Yeah. Okay, lovely. Listen, um, uh, firstly, uh, apologies for not being able to be with you in person. Um, unfortunately, I have a, an ongoing medical issue that restricts my driving, and so I'm not able to join you. So sorry, sorry for that. Um, by way of introduction, my name is Liam Kelly. I'm an inspector in the PSNI, uh, and I'm the current chairman uh, of the Police Federation for Northern Ireland, uh, a post I've held for the last 18 months. Um, I've also been a police officer in total for, for some 29 years now. Um, so I'm, I'm well versed uh, in, 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 in talking about policing matters. Uh, I've been asked um, as a result of uh, a deputisation for your council today to, to, to speak about the societal impact on the proposed reductions on police officer and police staff numbers. Um, by way of uh, introduction to that, as of the 1st of November uh, this year, uh, PSNI is currently made up of 6,557 police officers and 2,358 police staff members. Uh, those figures will be updated uh, in another few days uh, to reflect from the 1st of December. Um, but it's my understanding that both those numbers are down by uh, another 30 or 40 uh, of each. Um, and that's a, a direct consequence of the PSNI operating in a deficit budget. Uh, and there will be consequences uh, for that. And in fact, we're experiencing some of those consequences um, as we speak. 
Um, but by way of explanation, uh, this is over a, a rolling three year period. Um, last year, the PSNI um, had a fifty nine million pound deficit, um, which they were able to find uh, through doing efficiencies uh, and closing down parts of the police estate. Uh, this year, uh, they started with a, a, a negative budget of one hundred and forty one million pounds. Uh, and uh, so far, they've got that down to uh, thirty eight million. Uh, still in deficit. However, that doesn't reflect uh, any pay award for either police officers or, or police staff um, for the year 2023. Uh, so that figure has been upwardly revised to, to reflect that to be in around about £52 million pounds deficit um, as things stand today. Uh, what that means in real terms is that if the PSNI were to be allocated uh, £52 million, pounds, it would mean that uh, we would have a, 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 a zero budget. Um, or, or a balanced budget. Uh, and what I mean by that is that would still mean that the status quo that currently remains would, would stay as is. It would just mean that that, that Pace and I have got a balanced budget. So so where are we at the moment? Um, I mean, basically, that we're, we're in a bit of a bad place, a really bad place, uh, and it's a place not of our own making. Um, policing has not had the, uh, the, the budget allocated to it to make it sufficient to be able to provide the full services that it can. And we're starting to see the consequences of that now. So this year was uh, from April. Um, we have, have had no uh, recruitment um, and the police officer numbers. Uh, and that's against the backdrop where we've had a number of officers are leaving service, not only on, on retirement, um, but leaving service either early in their careers or mid careers. And, and that's a direct consequence of PSNI being unable to uh, pay uh, an effective and, and a competitive salary. Uh, and it's also a, a sad reflection that uh, some 25 years after the signing of the Good Friday Agreement, that we still have a, a, a terrorist threat where our officers are being targeted both on and off duty. Uh, and you don't need me to tell uh, the, the Council of Derry, Selling and Shraban. It was in November of last year uh, where we had that, the, the first uh, attack on our, our officers uh, in, your, in your city. Uh, and also the device left outside Waterside Police Station. Uh, and then moving down the country towards Omar, we had that terrible attack in February on, on Detective Chief Inspector John Caldwell. Um, th now, those things uh, and compounded by the data breach um, that uh, occurred uh, over the summer months uh, has resulted in Pace and I having uh, spiraling sickness levels um, with reducing resource because there hasn't been investment in policing. We've, we've seen officers um, having increased workloads um, and their morale has plummeted. Um, and because of no lift, uh, uplift in remuneration, we've seen a lot of junior officers who were employed uh, to come into the police service uh, being unable to take second employment um, because of the nature of their role as police officers, uh, and which has resulted in them moving on to, um, to other careers. Uh, one of the things that we've also had to manage uh, is industrial action. Uh, police officers are, by legislation, unable to take industrial action. Um, we're pretty unique in the public sector, along with our, our military colleagues in that regard. Um, what we have seen is that we, it is us that have to police um, the other uh, public sector bodies who do take industrial action. And in fact, it's us that pick up the, the shortfall on some of those occasions. And an example of that is that some of our officers being required to drive ambulances, for example, um, when, when there was some of the um, uh, strike action in, in the in health sector. Um, we are the we are the service of, of first and last resort, um, and unfortunately, um, we are the people that the society calls upon when when things go wrong or when other public sector bodies are unable to answer their their, their calls for help. And I suppose the, the the question that I will I'll put to yourselves as elected representatives is, what would happen if if the police office the police uh, as a body were not, were unable to provide their 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 full statutory function? Because I believe we are getting to that point now, um, because of the cripple and budget and the impact that that is is having, uh, and and to move on um, uh, from that point, as what we're what we're finding is for a long time, police officers and police have been involved in in supporting our partner agencies and supporting the gaps in our partner agencies. We are finding more and more that we're having to pick up the slack in relation to providing mental health support uh, to people. Uh, and also social services with social services as well. Um, but and unfortunately, we just do not, as things stand at the minute, have the capacity to be able to maintain that going forward. 
So if, if our budget issue is not addressed, uh, and it's difficult to address the present because we haven't got our own devolved administration, uh, and the, the Conservative Party uh, as a leading party in, in Westminster uh, seem focused now on, on turning their attention to survival uh, in relation to their, their own re-election uh, when the general election is called next year. So unfortunately, policing in Northern Ireland is well down the political radar uh, in Westminster, and, and to date, we, we've had no comfort uh, or no additional budget has been been provided to our our our, our former our UG constable um, to ensure that the services that we provide in, in Northern Ireland can be maintained. So I mean, I started the presentation by, by basically explaining that there would be consequences uh, as things stand um, for policing and the service that we can provide to society, and that has already started. Um, we've already seen uh, the decimation of our neighbourhood policing teams right across Northern Ireland. Uh, we have reduced visibility of police. We have police vehicles uh, unable to be uh, repaired because the money's not there to do it. So therefore, that reduces the visibility and the ability of patrols to be conducted. Um, that results in more reduced community interaction. Um, another consequence we've seen is, is a, a decline in, in reporting uh, of matters to police because the reality is we're not going to be able to respond as effectively as we have uh, in the past. And slower or reduced investigations will produce poor criminal justice outcomes um, for victims of crime. Um, so the confidence levels in policing uh, will, will recede and the, as those levels drop. Now, it's not all bad news because um, you may have seen the Her Majesty's Inspector Constabulary uh, released a report earlier this year. Um, which showed that uh, Northern Ireland is actually one of the safest places um, uh, for people to live in the entire United Kingdom. Uh, the rate uh, of crimes is 58.6 crimes per 1,000 uh, people. Uh, that's on average across Northern Ireland. Um, and comparable in, in England and Wales, that number is 93.6. Um, so, that's, I mean, that's a credit to our, our officers and our staff for the, for the, the, the work that they're putting in. Uh, that they're able to maintain those, those really, really encouraging levels that, that, uh, and making sure that we can keep our, our public and our society safe. However, the, the consequences of, of, of our numbers continuing to reduce uh, and in the absence of a, of a proper budget, is it's going to be extremely difficult to maintain um, that level. And I think the reality and the phrase that's been used, less, less policing equals less, less police equals less policing. Uh, and unfortunately, we've seen in the past and that there are uh, crime and terrorist gangs who are quite willing to step into the void here and provide what they term to be a, 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 a criminal justice outcome for people. Um, and, and that's a danger, uh, and that is a danger that we're very much alive to and don't want to see happening. Um, the, and, and I suppose in, in conclusion around with, with where I am, I mean, Der Derry City and Straban is an area uh, so one of the, the four areas in Northern Ireland that saw the overall number of recorded crimes uh, in 2023 rising. Um, according to the, the crime rate uh, website, um, it's 90%, uh, it's greater as 90% more dangerous to live in Derry City and Shraban. The, the only place ahead of it is, is Belfast City, um, well, which is a, a pretty scary statistic. Because what that's showing is that the crime uh, crimes against the person, and what I mean by that is like sexual offences, robbery, assaults, uh, and also offences of, of theft, drugs, um, and possession of weapons are all in the rise, uh, and they're all in the rise in, in, in four specific areas, and one of those areas, unfortunately, is, is Derry City and Straban. Um, so we need uh, the, the government to produce uh, a proper budget for PSNI uh, to enable us not only to, to maintain the, the crime uh, rates and, and clearances that we're currently doing, but actually just start, so we can start recruiting again and to get our numbers up in our neighbourhood policing teams, to increase that visibility, uh, which in, in turn will result in an in increased, better public uh, criminal justice outcomes um, for society, um, but also increased public confidence um, for policing. Thank you, Liam. Uh, it's a very detailed presentation. Um, Councillor Jackson's my first indicated speaker. Um, Chair, and. Um... You're very welcome, Liam, to uh, address um, this committee. And I know you've you've sort of touched on the, the crux of the, the issue here in relation to the approach from a cabinet of millionaires in London um, and their attack on public services. 
I'm right across the north, and we I can we completely agree with you in relation to public services in the north are well down the political radar. Um, it doesn't just um, impact um, the police service. It, 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 you see an attack on our public services right across, and we're, we're all seeing day and daily um, the impact of that and the workings of it. Um, whether it's in health, education, or in justice, as you've outlined, and as essentially a, a trade union for um, for police, um, uh, for serving police officers, um, we as a council, um, you know, it, it's only right that that you get the opportunity to come to this council and they highlight the concerns of your members, such as increased workloads. Morales, plummeting, um, the issues in, in relation to retention. Um, those, those, uh, it's it's a pretty uh, consistent voice that we're hearing right across all trade unions, um, regardless of any of our public sector. Um, so, I w I would like to commend the the police federation for their work on highlighting those issues that are that are being experienced by. The, the members that you represent, um, but Chair, I know at at this it was it was this committee or it was uh, it, well, it's certainly the corporate position of council um, has raised concerns in relation to the police police federation in the past, and we've and it it was in 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 relation to. Public confidence and policing um, within this city and district, and the actions taken by the police federation that have went some way to damage police confidence, uh, confidence in policing, and I'm specifically in re I'm referring to the decision for the police federation to um, they support uh, a judicial review against an ombudsman's report. Um, highlighted um, RUC collusive behaviour within this district. Um, our council has um, expressed our dis dismay at the representative body of serving PSNI officers. They attempt to deny victims families access to truth and justice. And that's this is the first opportunity that we've had to raise this directly with you. And I suppose uh, completely supporting the issues that you've highlighted, but it's only right that we, we do highlight the concerns that we've had, we've got, and in relation to representing the views of your members, um, pose a question. Did you consult your membership before using your resources to attempt to deny victims within this city and district access to truth and justice by opposing the police ombudsman's report? And, and and I suppose a very simple question, is it the role of the Police Federation to defend the actions of the RUC? Because that uh, that goes to the core of, of the, the confidence issue in relation to um, the current serving police officers um, that, that are, that, that are tra working day and daily day provide a public service to people um, of this city and district. So I, I, I agree with the, the sentiments that you, you've highlighted in relation to an attack on budgets um, for public services here in the north. But it's only right that we, 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 we continue to reiterate the concerns that this council have raised specifically on the organisation that you're here representing. Um, Karamina Mogut, Chair. Councillor Jackson, Councillor Harkins indicated to speak, and then I can come back to you then, Liam, if that's okay. Thank you, uh, Chair. Um, look, this uh, your your invitation to do a deputation here today wasn't something I supported. I actually voted against it. Um, uh, it was attached to, I believe, a motion about opposing uh, cuts to our public services and back and strikes uh, by public sector workers. Um, Look, you referenced an, uh, a number of attacks uh, on uh, the police, and that's certainly not something we support or condone. Um, but that there is, in terms of the police budget, uh, you know, the 
police is an organisation um, that a lot of people don't have confidence in. And, and as it was mentioned, there's been discussion after discussion here about uh, the role of the police and it's, uh, how it's antagonising communities, whether that's the way the police acted in terms of the Black Lives Matter protests and, and the racism that it's displayed there. Uh, you know, the huge levels of misogyny inside the police that is on record uh, regularly in our newspapers. Um, now we're seeing harassment by the police of uh, Palestine solidarity activists. We, we, we've had a, a lot of strikes over the last couple of years, and we've seen the police harassing striking workers, not supporting them. Uh, actually harassing them on picket lines. I've witnessed that myself here in this uh, city. Um, strip and search, heavy-handed policing uh, of communities here. And the police, uh, uh, and, and also uh, participation in the denial of truth and justice to victims of collusion. And the police have uh, refused to be accountable and are not held accountable. Um, so, you know, that's why uh, the, there, there is a huge concern with the billions that the Secretary of State uh, is slashing here in terms of budgets, um, but that the funding for the police is not going to be high for the vast majority of people in terms of their concerns. Um, we're going to see this week now um, more strikes. Tomorrow, our teachers are out on strikes. Our schools are being damaged by the Secretary of State. We're going to see the Northwest Regional College lectures out on strike again on Thursday. And then on Friday, we're going to have a shutdown of our public transport system, both uh, buses and rail. Um, and people are doing that because of the damage and the contempt that the British Secretary of State um, has and I think that all of these cuts show the the utter contempt that the British government has for people here, um, and I think that that's what we need to highlight. Um, I, I I don't think that the police are playing a, uh, any role really in trying to push back against those cuts. They're certainly not uh, taking action against them as as we see other public sector workers doing um, and defending the public services as well. And, and you mentioned there about responding to uh, mental health issues. I mean, this is something that we as a council have agreed that the police should actually have no role in. It's not this that you shouldn't have the uh, capacity for it. The police are not trained to be responders to mental health issues. So this is part of the problem. I don't want to see the police taking on this role because what ends up happening is people who are suffering with mental health, health end up uh, getting criminalised as a result of having people who, who do not have the expertise to help people in distress and actually deepen the problem. And this is what we see uh, over and over again. Um, so I think that, look, the, the, the police have a track record of refusing to be held accountable. Um, and, and that's part of the problem. Uh, and the, the, you know, I think that the, we need to highlight the, the you know, if, if there's more money it should be spent on addressing deprivation. It should be spent on addressing the damage that's being done by government to our communities. It should be spent on our schools. It should be spent on, a, on investing in our uh, public transport system. It should be uh, invested in protecting our environment. And that's just not happening. Thank you, Councillor Harkin. Uh, Liam, I'll pass back to you to respond to those two and then have two further speakers after, after that. <coughs> Um, yeah, well, I mean, quite quite a bit um, for for me to unpack there. Um, I have to say, at first instance, um, I'm surprised uh, that I'm being asked uh, about things which, in my mind, were nothing to do with the subject matter. Um, I've been asked to come today, but irrespective of that, uh, as an association, uh, we re do represent uh, the views of our members. We're elected, and to represent the views of our members and. Um, in relation to um, police ombudsman investigations, uh, there's legal process, um, which is uh, we asked our membership to to look at uh, in relation to um, things that affect our members and affect our our, our, our retired cadre. So of course, um, we would we would take the legal action to do that, um, and and that's not to try and hinder um, uh, justice or, or or potential outcomes for people. It's to make sure that it's been done fairly, proportionately, and, and appropriately. And we will continue to make those decisions so we can agree to, to, to disagree uh, on that one. Uh, again, as a representative body, we do reflect uh, the, the, the attitudes and, 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 and the behaviours of, of our membership. 
uh, and, and we have a statutory responsibility to do that. Um, in relation to the, the other public sector bodies, absolutely. I mean, and, and I'm a member of the community as much as, as everyone else is in this room, and I can see the impact on education, on health, on social services in every part of the public sector. And I absolutely uh, agree uh, that, that the issue here is, 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 is a lot bigger than, than just policing. But I'm here today as an advocate for policing uh, and, and to express my uh, concerns and, and outline what I think uh, are some of the considerations that people that people should have. So, I mean, as I started with, well, we are the service of first and last resort uh, in our public services. And when other public services aren't able to do uh, what they're, 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 they're obliged to, to be doing or, or to be tried to do, uh, the next thing that, that our public call upon is the police service. Uh, and what I'm saying is, as things uh, continue with our reducing budget, uh, and as things start to go backwards, the police are not going to be able to do that. They're, not, they're going to have to start to prioritise about what they can or can't attend to. Uh, and, and I absolutely agree that, that, that police officers are not mental health professionals. However, you go to any hospital, you go to Alta Galvin, uh, seven nights a week, and look at the amount of police vehicles that are there, um, because it's the health service are asking the police officers to come uh, and assist. Uh, and therefore, we're sort of duty bound to try and assist. And there's going to have to be clear lines going forward about what that actually looks like. It's not an effective use of police resources to have three or four crews of police officers sitting at a hospital for an entire shift, uh, while other calls are, are, are not being attended to. And I've sort of reflected those uh, slightly earlier about the crime rates in Derry City and Strabane have gone up in relation to sexual offences, robbery, assaults, theft, drugs. While police officers are attending the mental health issues in hospitals, nobody else is att attending any of those other calls, or they're being stacked up for people to attend uh, whenever they have capacity to do that. And, and that is becoming more and more difficult. So, uh, I mean, our new chief constable has, 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 some, has some serious um, conversations to be having with, with his, his peers and the other public services about what police are going to be able to do going forward. Now, that can be addressed. Uh, and, and certainly the short term uh, by by an injection of a, a proper budget and not only a proper budget into into the PSNI, but a proper injection of, of, of budget into, uh, for example, our health service. Uh, and I mean, only two weeks ago, the Department of Finance announced that already uh, they're projecting a 450 million pounds deficit uh, in, in their budget um, to, to the end of March this year. And that's without any pay awards uh, in relation to the entire public sector. When they factored in the pay awards, that figure was over a billion pounds. Um, so, I mean, uh, and, and that's, I say, that's excluding uh, the deficit I've already explained in the, in the police service. So, I mean, when you add all that together, it's, it's eye-watering uh, sums of money. But in my mind, if our society and, and our community is going to be able to, to, to grow and to, and, and to develop going forward, it's going to need that significant investment. And, and really, I don't think we can wait uh, until a general election occurs to, to whether or not um, we get a new uh, a new government uh, in, in England and Wales uh, who might be more sympathetic uh, and, and use the barn of consequential a wee bit, uh, a wee bit more pragmatically um, for our services in Northern Ireland, or whether or not we're going to be able to get a new, uh, uh, our, our government is going to be able to reform in the short to medium term. But if, if they reform without uh, having an effective budget, they underpin what they're doing. Then I think, uh, as a society, we're we're on an absolute hiding to nothing here, and and from a policing perspective, uh, all I can see is is that the the uh, the outworkings of that uh, for our community is going to be a, a reduced police service and not as an effective police service, slower outcomes, uh, and and basically um, uh, it's going to reduce in in, in, in absolutely terrible uh, levels of of public confidence in policing because policing is not going to be able to deliver uh, what people need. Thank you, Liam. Uh, Councillor Tierney. Thank you, Chair, uh, and thank you, Liam, um, for your presentation this far. Um, you're very welcome, um, and I think it's a it's a welcome um, deputation that we're that we're receiving today. Um, but once again, we are hearing from an organisation um, who are tasked with providing a service across the north, um, but are not tasked with the budget to provide that service. Um, and I think that's um, a shame, not just for yourselves, but for all of the other public services which are um, running at a huge shortfall. Um, I do thank you for the uh, information that you provided in advance of this meeting because I find it quite interesting. Uh, and just looking at the, the societal impact 
um, of not having a, a budget that runs an effective and efficient um, police service. Internal consequences, data breaches, increased terrorist activity, increased workload, sickness levels spiraling out of control, no recruitment, no uplift in remuneration, all internal issues, but all have an impact on wider society in terms of trying to provide uh, the, the service that, that, you, that the PSNA try to provide. And then the external consequences, uh, the neighbourhood policing, reduced visibility, reduced community interactions, decline in reporting, slower reduction uh, in investigations, poor criminal justice outcomes for victims, um, and confidence level drops. Again, all impacts on wider society. Um, and I suppose each of the external consequences has an even further consequence on the last one, which is confidence in policing. Um, and I think if, if we're going to be honest, that is an issue um, across Derry and Straban. Um, it's a historical issue, um, and it's one, I suppose, that the PSNA in many ways and in many areas have inherited. Um, but it is nonetheless a huge issue, even 25 years after the signing of the Good Friday Agreement. But it is one that, unless it is properly financed, um, is not going to be able to be built um, because as you have rightly said, you're going to see less police on the ground. You're going to see longer times for investigations um, and, 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 and things like that, which only impact on uh, people. So people will tell you that it doesn't matter that we're not in Stormont. It doesn't matter that we're not doing this, and it doesn't matter that we're not doing that. Here's another example of how it does matter, how having local accountable ministers in position can help ordinary people. And that's, I think, your your, your presentation shows that today. Um, some people have touched on um, some things that, that you say was, was not part of the of the subject, um, and, I, and I appreciate that. I do, however, um, agree particularly with, with Councillor Jackson's point um, around the justice for, for, for victims. Um, and I think it is good to have that conversation when you're here. Um, and, you know, if we are going to um, have this conversation, then let's have a, a full um, view um, at how we can um, support you better. But with supporting you better, there has to be an opportunity also for us to challenge where we feel that things um, have um, perhaps not been handled in the right manner. Um, I would also be keen, um, Liam, to find out um, your organisation's opinion on 50-50 recruitment within the PSNA um, and how you see that potentially going forward. Because I think that's um, when we're talking about budget cuts um, and confidence in policing, I think 50-50 recruitment is a major uh, aspect of that. And I would be keen to, to hear your own your own thoughts um, or your organization's thoughts on it. Um, I don't know, and I, I, it wasn't made clear in the presentation, unless I missed something, what the, I suppose the main ask of, of this committee or, or, the, or this council is in relation to your own organisation, but I would be keen to hear it. Um, I'm assuming, like most other public service or even um, trade unions that, that, that we have before us, it is to support, um, and I know you can't go on strike, but to support your calls for, for increased budgets um, and, and things like that. But I would be keen to know, you know, what can we do here? Uh, I think the obvious thing is encouraging people to get back onto the executive and get the budget rolled out. But if that doesn't happen, what's the next step around this? Thanks very much, Chair. Thank you, Councillor Terry. Alderman Hussie. Uh, thank you, Chair. And can I initially very proudly declare an interest with family members who serve, uh, both as officers and civilian staff, something I'm very proud of. Um, Liam, thank you for accepting the uh, invitation to come to us today. Uh, stepping into the, into the lion's den, perhaps, uh, as you've already experienced. Um, through you, uh, can I also thank our local officers and civilian staff for their ongoing efforts uh, in the interests of public safety and indeed confidence in our area. Uh, I don't think anybody uh, really expects us to go back to Dixon of Duck Green or, or Heartbeat. 
But uh, it touches on, on particularly the confidence issue. Lobbies on the ground, you know, on the beat. Uh, I realise the issues that uh, a lack of numbers present with regard to that, and particularly with regard to the rural presence uh, that many in, in the rural community would like to see the increased presence of officers. Um, to give them confidence to to in, increase their their feeling of safety, uh, you've mentioned that you know it's Northern Ireland one of the safest places in the United Kingdom, etc. But it's the perception uh, which is perhaps something that has to be addressed. Um, uh, you've already highlighted the fact of numbers, and I think therein lies. Uh, Part of the solution, if, if people would uh, allow the resources for those numbers to be brought up to the levels that were expected from Patton. My understanding is Patton had talked in terms of 7,500 officers, but Patton also included within that a reserve cadre, and indeed uh, there was talk of community support officers. Um, I, I'd like to know the thoughts of the Federation with regard to, yes, you, you want to get up to uh, the, the, the required numbers, but the, the issue of reserve or community support officers, uh, I know that was knocked on the head uh, because of community issues, shall we say, uh, but are there areas where that should now be being considered as support to your officers on the ground? Uh, and just a final point on the, on the 50 50. Uh, I, have, I have no difficulty with uh, recruitment being on the basis that is reflective of community balance. And our, we all realise our community goes beyond two communities now, or two parts of the communities. There, there are others outside of that who need to be considered. Uh, indeed, one of the best officers I knew for a long time, who's now deceased, was a, of Chinese descent, but that's neither here nor there. Um, so that reflection of community balance, but at the same time, uh, you know, it, it's it's the quality of the person, irrespective of what community they come from, that should be a, a point of order, issue. Or sorry, Chair. My question was to the Federation, not the Alderman Hussey, and I would prefer an answer from the Federation and not from Alderman Hussey. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. I was just responding on my thoughts on it uh, and being, uh, hoping or asking the Federation their thoughts on it, the same as you have done. Uh, Chair, that, that's it. And again, thanks, Liam, for coming along and entering uh, this arena. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Alderman Hussey. Alderman McMorris is my final indicated speaker, Liam, and then I'll pass back to yourself for closing comments. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Chair, for allowing me in. I know I'm not um, a member of this committee, but uh, I felt it rele relevant to come in and, and listen to what the Federation had to say. First of all, Liam, thank you very much for um, your presentation here today. I'm sure it's not easy to come and defend the, the, the police service at the moment, especially with budget restraints and, and all sorts of um, lack of confidence. Um, I was kind of... Um, Disheartened to hear the the stats, and I know you're saying that uh, Northern Ireland is one of the safest places to live within the UK. But I was disheartened to hear that um, it was 90 percent more dangerous to live in the Derry City and Strabane District um, Council. Um, I know confidence in the place has been an issue that I have been raising. Um, I had a meeting there recently with Abel McManus, and we also have another um, meeting on the day we to discuss that further and how we can. You know, get a wee bit of confidence in the, in the police um, service. Um, now, I do take on board the, about the social impacts, and um, we had the Western Trust on there um, doing a deputation there just a week or two ago. And um, basically, that was one of the issues that I had highlighted the fact that, you know, the police service are sitting in A and E, you know, three, four, five officers maybe at a time. And, and I really do think that that's something that has to be addressed um, ASAP. As another speaker indicated, you know, you are trained, 
Do you know what I mean? But you know, it, it can only have an impact on all of them other issues that you have highlighted because of the fact that you spend so much time um, within our hospitals and dealing with mental health um, patients. I understand that they are the most vulnerable people within our society and um, technically they need that support. And um, if the health service isn't there to do it, you know, unfortunately, it just falls on yourselves to pick up that um, gap. Um, I'm also, you know, I'm not surprised to hear about the spiral and um, sick leave within the PSNA at the moment. Um, I can only um, imagine that that has something to do with the fact that they are um, probably overworked trying to cover all aspects of um, placing. But I'm, I'm also, um, I'd just like to know your thoughts on has this anything to do with um, basically the data breaches and stuff that has happened within the police service. And, um, you know, I'm, I'm sure that I know people who work within the, the police and, and staffing, and I'm sure that that has a, had a knock on effect in their own mental health and, um, you know, and how they feel about um, being working in the community under the, the difficult circumstances that they do. Um, so I'd just like to hear um, a wee bit about that. And um, just um, to thank yourself and um, all the officers that who do a sterling amount of work, you know, within our communities. And I just want to just maybe touch on a wee bit more about um, the neighbourhood policing, Liam. You know, um, I keep highlighting the importance of a neighbourhood policing, and, and I think if we want to address the confidence in the police issue, I think that that's where the solution lies. We need to get back to good, effective neighbourhood policing, where people like myself can work along with the police uh, and the communities, and um, you know, and progress that. So I just want to hear your views on that. Uh, but I really appreciate you coming along, uh, Liam, and thanks. Very much for your presentation. Thank you. Thank you, Alderman McMorris. Liam, I'll pass back to yourself. There's a couple of comments within those points raised from members. If you want to respond and, and you'll be closing remarks then. Thank you. Uh, okay, listen, uh, thank you. I've I've taken a few notes here. Uh, so hopefully I'll I'll be able to pick up on on uh, all, if if not most, of, of what had, had been asked. So I suppose the, the first thing uh, I was asked was around the uh, what is my ask? Um, to Derry City and Strabane Council um, uh, around the deputization today. Uh, and, and it's really to, to, to uh, advocate for, for a, a proper budget, not only for uh, our other public sector bodies, but uh, for specifically for, for policing and uh, to enable policing to get out of this um, uh, spiral uh, that we find ourselves in. Uh, an effective budget will, will, will ha not only have a transformational effect on, on the ability of the police to provide the functions that it does, um, but it will have a transformational effect, in my mind, uh, cascading uh, across our society. Um, if, if we're able to provide uh, a, a better police service, that can only have, have better outcomes um, for, for our society in general. So, so that's, that, that's in, in simple terms, as, as may I ask. Um, if, if we can't advocate to our, our local politicians, if we don't have a, uh, a government set up again at Stormont, uh, then we, we would be asking uh, our councils, uh, either through their respective political parties or uh, or of their independence, to, to write to the Secretary of State, uh, explaining what their uh, collective concerns are um, and, and for our community and for our society. Um, in relation to 50-50 recruitment, uh, again, uh, I fully uh, I fully accept all police services have to accept that they need to be as representative as they can be, uh, and and fifty fifty was a, a fairly blunt tool uh, as far as the pattern reforms to try and raise the number of officers from a a Northern Irish Catholic background um, uh, in in the uh, in the into the PSNI um, going forward, uh, and I did have a substantial success when I joined the police service in nineteen ninety four. Uh, there was uh, in around about 8% um, uh, of uh, my colleagues ha had a community background uh, classed as Roman Catholic. Um, and by the time the 50-50 the ended, that number was, was in around uh, 30 to 33%. Uh, and it has started, unfortunately, to, to go backwards. Um, so, I mean, I think there needs to be some initiatives brought in. Uh, I don't know whether 50-50 will be the, in, in totality, it never was the, the, the silver bullet. Uh, I'm sorry to use that terminology in this because the, the reality around it is, is this is a societal problem uh, of which p the police service have a, a role to play. 
Um, the, the problem that we have is that some of our officers coming from a, a, a nationalist Roman Catholic background in Northern Ireland are being targeted by terrorists and so are their families, uh, which is resulting in them not being able to sustain their careers. Another issue that, that spans, spins off this is, is that if we have an officer who is from Derry City and Straban, um, from a Roman Catholic background, they're unable to serve in Derry City and Straban um, because of that uh, threat that, that's to them and to their families. So, and, and what that means is that people have to give up uh, all their support base and their family bases to move away to be a police officer. And sometimes that move away can be down, uh, down to Fermanagh or it could be down uh, across the Causeway Coast and Glens or wherever it is. But, but basically, uh, it comes back to your, your, uh, your last uh, councillors uh, talk about neighbourhood policing. The most effective neighbourhood police officers are officers that know their own communities and are from those communities. And unfortunately, uh, we're in a position at the moment um, because of that terrorist threat um, that, that that's not able to happen uh, as regularly as it could do. Uh, and, and that's a, a matter of great consequence. So as a society, again, uh, and I have mentioned this before, uh, about 25 years after the, the, the signing of the Good Friday Agreement, um, uh, by this point, I think most people envisage that that, that are the, the, the spectre of terrorism, and Chris Patton certainly did, uh, wouldn't be something that still dominates uh, the policing landscape uh, in, in Northern Ireland. Um, so. Uh, again, 50-50 recruitment, I, I think it's, um, well, we're, we're certainly not against 50-50 recruitment in totality, uh, but again, I, I echo the, the comments of the second speaker. Uh, we're more interested in, in, in having people that want to be police officers in the police uh, and want to provide a police and service and have the right skills, attributes uh, and, uh, and, and drive. Um, rather than, than, than that, that they're being appointed because of their community background, because it's disingenuous to them uh, and, and it's disingenuous to our society. Um, second speaker mentioned about the, the, the danger of reduced resource and that the rural communities could suffer. And unfortunately, that's one of the things that, that if we move, uh, we continue the trajectory in relation to our budget around resource, our, our resource will have to be prioritised. Uh, and what that effectively means is that the areas in Northern Ireland that are deemed our high crime areas may see more police officers being directed towards that to deal with that. And that will leave gaps. Uh, and those gaps are primarily in, in your more rural areas, um, which are harder to, harder to police per se because of the, uh, the, the, the geographic and, and the, the actual area of coverage that needs to be done. Um, so it's, it's no, um, it should be no shock to anybody that what we find is that when police officers are, are taken away from, from patrolling in, in those areas, that the, the crime levels, and particularly, particularly in agricultural crime, uh, exponentially raise. Um, because uh, the, the, the criminals know that, that the, the resource is not going to be there uh, to either dissuade them from, from taking uh, their criminal activities or uh, that the chances of them being, uh, being caught uh, are, are significantly reduced. So that absolutely is, is something that should be, it should be on your, your, your radar of, of concern. Um, we also reflected about the overall numbers in Patton. Uh, and again, I'm on record already as talking about this. When Chris Patton produced his report in 1999, uh, his, uh, his figure that, that he found was 7,500, and that was against uh, a backdrop of having uh, no terrorist uh, threat uh, to have to police. Now, what we found in the census of 2021 is our population has actually risen by 300,000 people in that period, um, and, and obviously that's happened right across the UK. Uh, to address that in England and Wales, the government uh, introduced an uplift programme where they brought in a, a 20,000 uh, police officers up in, in over a 12-month period. So by, by my calculations, um, uh, the, the number uh, that, that should actually be now when you reflect that into 2023 is 8,600 um, police officers. At the minute, we're sitting you know, in around 6,500 uh, and going backwards quite rapidly. I mean, I think Pace and I have already uh, projected that by, by March next year, that number could be as low as 6,300. Uh, and then uh, 12 months on, actually below 6,000. I, I actually think it's going to be higher than that. Um, I have a number of, of reasons for saying that, but the principal reason for saying that uh, is to do with the, how uh, the public sector pensions have changed since the introduction of the uh, career average scheme in 2015. And so what we're finding is there are a number of officers now coming up to retirement where it actually um, works against them um, to work on. So they can actually accrue more pension benefit, but they lose out um, because of the, their, their old uh, pension scheme. It actually starts working against the new pension scheme. So it's actually more financially prudent for them to retire. So I, I reckon, you know, if the current trajectory goes of, of us losing between 40 and 60 officers a month, 
uh, you know, I, I reckon by by the the end of March, you know, that number that we're we're looking at now, and that's just retirements. I'm not talking about people leaving, uh, and and we're already seeing that officers, particularly the younger officers, are leaving because of the cost of living crisis and and the the rentability and to, to work overtime because the organisation hasn't got the money to pay them to work overtime, uh, and they're constrained in relation to secondary employment, um, because by virtue of the fact that they are they are police officers, so. Um, the, the cadre that's there to support police officers in the background is our, well, we have in Ireland, is our part time um, police officers. Uh, and again, their, their recruitment of those officers uh, over time has diminished. And we've now less than uh, 200 uh, part time officers. And obviously, that would be uh, fantastic if the budget was available, uh, that, that their, their numbers could be increased to provide that level of support to their, to their full time colleagues. Um, but again, as things stand in, in relation to the current budget, that number is just uh, a reducing number. Uh, and I mean, the age demographic, uh, they had a, actually a, a, a 50th anniversary, um, uh, which was delayed due to COVID, uh, but it occurred last year. And the age demographic of that was the, the youngest part time officer was, was sort of late 20s, uh, and the eldest was in the 70s. Um, uh, and unfortunately, uh, they, the, the numbers involved there are, are, are a diminishing number. Uh, and are not able to provide that sort of support that uh, that that's needed um, at the moment. And uh, not because they don't want to, um, because but it's because the PS and I haven't got the number to to or haven't got the budget to invest in them and, and to give them additional hours where they could make a, a tangible difference. Um, levels, um, did the data breaches impact on uh, Again, I think in the in the first month after the data breach. Uh, PSNI has, on average, for for police officers, between four and five hundred officers absent on a daily basis. Uh, and the month after the data breach, that number rose to eight hundred, uh, and uh, a number of officers were citing the data breaches and the stresses as a result of the data breaches, um, and 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 causing that. Thankfully, that number uh, has has re reduced back to, to to what the the sort of pre data breach levels are, but it's still a significantly high number out of out of six and a half thousand people. Um, that, that 500 of them on a daily basis are, are not available to, to, to come to work. Um, it's not, unfortunately, just the data breaches that causes that. Uh, as I've sort of alluded to, with having reduced resource, uh, there's more pressure uh, building up uh, on our officers. Um, and unfortunately, one of the, the, the consequences of, uh, of, of dealing with the sort of things that police officers have to deal with on a daily basis, um, our occupational health hasn't been able to, to, hasn't been invested in sufficiently to enable our officers to be um, uh, and have their mental health and their physical health uh, managed uh, in a timely manner. Uh, I mean, the, the, the waiting list uh, to see a psychologist in PSNI is, is, is coming up to eight months, um, which, you know, as any psychology and anybody with a medical background will tell you, you can't sit and wait for eight months um, to see someone if you need help. Uh, and then when you reach out through your own, uh, your own uh, general practice uh, or the NHS, the waiting times are even worse. Um, so again, that 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 compounds uh, the issue that we have that people are going off with long term serious health conditions and they're not being able to be treated effectively to get them back into the workplace quickly. Um, another thing, and, and which I have spoken on Radio Foil about, um, is and particular to your council area, is the uh, spiral level of assaults uh, on police officers as well. Uh, which has resulted in them having to take time off for for re re recuperation. So uh, again, uh, and I'm sp speaking to ACC Bobby Singleton yesterday, and the the figures that uh, were, are going to come out sort of uh, in the next month are, are going to show that that number has gone up yet again. Uh, uh, so again, that's that's going to need uh, to be addressed uh, at some point in the future too, with with more effective um, uh, sentences being being applied not only to police officers but all emergency service workers, but Again, as I said at the start of this, I'm I'm an advocate here for for policing today, uh, and that's why I, I'm 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 here to talk about that. So the assault levels need to, to reduce as well, and that will have an impact on on those sickness levels. Um, and finally, neighbourhood policing. Uh, I mean, our, our previous chief constable made a commitment uh, in relation to his hallmarks of policing and and building up the, the neighbourhood officer numbers. And at one point there, we were up to right across Northern Ireland of having seven hundred dedicated neighbourhood police officers performing that sort of community interaction function that they do, problem solving, uh, interaction with local community groups, uh, uh, you know, and, and, and doing what I say is, is probably one of the most important roles in policing. What, what we have found um, uh, as a, a direct consequence of having no recruitment is, is there are no new officers coming through 
uh, to enable people to replace those neighbourhood officers who are retiring uh, and, and, and moving on to, to other parts of the service. And, and what we found as well is that our frontline local police team's response, uh, which is your response policing, so you pick up your telephone and somebody comes to your door, it's primarily a local policing team, will do that at first instance. Uh, the local policing team numbers are are diminishing on a day and daily basis, and there's nobody coming in to support them. So what has happened is, is the neighbourhood policing teams uh, are providing uh, that function. They're, they're backfilling into the local policing teams, which means they're not doing their own function. They're not performing that neighbourhood policing role uh, that we all uh, we all think is uh, you know a, a fantastic thing and that interaction. And, and the final thing on neighbourhood police, and I mentioned the number there was was seven hundred, um, probably about two years ago. That that number is now sitting in around about two hundred and fifty. Uh, that's the that's the attrition level uh, that we've seen o- over the last number of years. And we need, um, to say, to get that recruitment started again, which can address some of the um, re- representatives uh, in PSNI, but also enable our local policing teams. To then become our 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 neighbourhood officers of the future, and allow those officers to focus on on that very important community interaction that they perform. Thank you, Liam, and thank you for presenting the committee and taking the, the questions and concerns that have been raised on board. Um, and hopefully that can feed through under under your own work. Um, and it's certainly something that we as political representatives will take forward in our own. Um, political parties, I'm sure. Um, so we're going to move forward. As I say, thank you for the presentation. You can stay on if you want. You don't have to. Um, but we'll move. We'll move forward. Um, but thank you, Liam. Thanks very much. Yes, thank you very much. Uh, and again, at some point in the future, um, hopefully I'll be able to be more mobile again uh, sooner rather than later. Uh, I'm more than happy to come along and, and discuss some of the other matters. Uh, directly uh, with people and those concerns. It's it's good to talk around these things. And again, yeah. uh, we're not uh, we're not oblivious to concerns uh, about what we do or why we do certain things. Perfect. Thank you, Sir Liam. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Okay. So moving forward, then members, item six is our second deputation today, and I would like to welcome Seamus Le. Can you pronounce your name for me? <laughs> Yeah, honey, I just, <laughs> just wanted to make sure I said it right. Um, who's the chief executive of the Federation for the Housing Associations, and Sheena McKellian, who's chief executive of Apex, to provide an overview on the social housing delivery needs and its benefits across the council area. So I'll pass over to your so I'll pass over to yourselves for your presentation in just the same format, where we'll open it to members for comments. Then. Okay. Uh, Thank you very much for committee members and council for having us here today. Uh, My name is Seamus Lehenny. I'm Chief Executive of the Northern Ireland Federation of Housing Associations. Um, For anyone who's not really familiar with the association, we represent 20 housing associations that operate right across Northern Ireland here. Um, If we go to the first slide, I have a couple of slides here. And uh, next slide, please. Okay, Um, just as a quick overview of what the sector looks like. Um, So as employers, first and foremost, I suppose we employ over uh, 3,300 people, um, quite a lot here in the Derry and Straban district area as well. Uh, And what that means really in real terms, we would contribute over £79 million a year in wages and salaries into the local economy right across Northern Ireland. Um, what have we done last year? So um, usually people are quite um, really uh, interested in when they see the scale of the bill that we have. So across Northern Ireland last year, there's £362 million spent on land acquisition and construction of new properties as well. And I suppose the first thing we have to say is that basically there's a housing, social housing split into two providers, really. You have the housing associations um, that, that are like Apex, who I'm joined with here today, and then you have the Northern Ireland Housing Executive. Um, the housing executive uh, operate as a landlord capacity. They manage around about 80,000 properties, um, but they don't build new properties. So housing associations, as you can see there on the slide, at the moment we have just over 58,000 properties across Northern Ireland, but also we actively develop new properties as well. Um, Now, 
I'll, I'll touch on basically where we want to be with regards to building, how many we need to be building as well in a second. But what you can see there in the housing need, as of uh, the end of June there, there was over 45,000 uh, applicants on the waiting list for social housing here in Northern Ireland. And of those 45,000, over 33,000 are deemed in housing stress. Now, I would add, I got the figures there just the start of this week, between the end of July and uh, November, 400 applicants were added to the housing stress um, list there. And what I would stress, and I think a lot of you will hear from your constituents, is that there is a housing crisis right across uh, the north here uh, and within your own district area here as well. So if we go to the next slide, please, this is probably what will interest you most. This is where I delve into more specific into the Derry City and Strabane District Council area. So if we look at the breakdown on the housing type at the top, you'll see general needs, the vast majority here, 78%. And general needs is really people who are just living. There's there's no wraparound service there. They have the support, obviously, of the housing associations. But when we look at the other two, 22% of housing is sheltered and supported. So those are people who would otherwise, if they didn't have a housing association with those support services, they wouldn't be able to live independently. At the moment, right across the north, there's around about 19,000 people who rely on that support and um, people program. Uh, so that, and what that does is basically housing associations make sure those people aren't having to live under care of health trusts, that they can live independently near friends and family and their local community. If you look there on the left hand side, the size of existing properties, you can see it's, it's a fairly even breakdown between one to three bedroom properties um, and then a small a minority of them are four bedrooms or plus on that as well. And then here within the council area, there's just over uh, six and a half thousand um, homes provided by nine housing associations. And many of you be familiar and, and Sheena will be talking to you shortly. Apex obviously is one of the largest here in the north as well. And if you look then just to the right of that new tenant makeup, again, there's a bit of a split there really as well between the types of people who are living in, uh, in social housing. The, the majority split between single adults and single parents uh, and the next group of those people aged over the age of 60 as well. What are we building locally then um, in the Derry Straban area? You can see there's just over one and a half thousand units currently under construction, and then units programmed to start 752. Now, what I would touch on basically is that we're not building nowhere near as many homes um, that we need to be, and that's really down to the funding model. Uh, housing associations, and, and Sheena may well touch on this, basically, is that um, it's almost like a 50-50 split. Basically, we can't borrow more than what basically the department grant fund. Uh, the, the, the Department of Communities, as such as like the majority shareholder, we do the building. So at the moment, really, the Department for Communities, um, their budget, their capital building sh uh, budget shortfall is uh, £59 million. Pound. Um, from this year. It's a, that was a 27% cut in their budget and that ultimately meant that we get less money to build more social and affordable homes for people. Um, so at the moment this year, by the end of March this year, right across the north, we'll probably deliver just over 1,400 homes. We really need to be building a minimum, maybe about 2,200 homes a year if we want to make a serious dent on the waiting list on that. Um, we're, we're basically upholding our side of the deal, really, with um, work commenced. The Department for Communities put a target on the 20 associations to start work on um, 1,950 homes um, in the financial year 22-23. Uh, we managed to achieve a commencement of uh, just over 1,956. So despite a reduced budget and record levels of inflation, because don't, don't forget, I suppose, the, the money we get is then basically impacted by the inflation on materials and, and labour costs, etc. So that's a quick overview for me, and uh, I'll pass over to Sheena here now. Thank you, Seamus. Um, good evening, everyone, and thank you for the invitation um, to speak tonight. Um, just by way of background, if we move on to the next slide, um, in terms of Apex and who we are and, and where we came from, I'm going to talk a wee bit about that, what we deliver in this council area, um, and I'm going to focus on SCAG, which is our biggest development and probably the biggest development in Northern Ireland in many years. Um, the challenges and opportunities that are arising around that and maybe how we can work better with Council in, in terms of delivery. So the association was formed in 1965 by a group of individuals who came together in response to the poor housing conditions and significant housing need here in the city. 
Um, originally known as Dairy Housing Association, it was established in 1965 and in 1977 it registered with the department and that enabled it to access public funding. But between 1977 and probably the early 1990s, um, the focus of the organisation was in complementing the work of the housing executive, delivering sheltered housing and, as uh, Seamus mentioned, that supported housing um, for people with complex then in the 1990s, delivery of the social housing uh, development program moved from the housing executive to housing associations. And from that time, our focus really has been um, in delivering social housing, um, not only in the Derry City and Strabane District Council area, but right across Northern Ireland. So moving on to the next slide, please. At the 31st of March 2023, Apex provided 6,725 homes across Northern Ireland, and the bulk of those are here in the council area, 4,130. And this compares with the housing executive stock in the area of some 8,606. While our main focus in recent years has been delivering general needs for families and singles, we also provide more than 1,000 units of supported living accommodation. And for us, the, most, the majority of our provision is in this council area. And this includes accommodation for those with learning disabilities, mental health difficulties, older people, including the frail elderly, young people in need of support, and those with alcohol and drug addiction. And some of the services that you may be familiar with are the House in the Wells, Foyle Valley House, Abbey House, Alexander House, Culmore Park, Belmont Cottages, Daleview, Dunvale. Um, and we also work in partnership with a range of agencies, including Foyle Women's Aid, Methodist Mission and the Western Trust, where we provide accommodation and they provide the specialised support and care. We also provide affordable housing through our fair share um, shared ownership product as well. And we are very much focused on continuing to deliver high quality, energy efficient homes and supporting the development of thriving communities. And given the housing demand and increasing need that Seamus has touched on, I think that's still as important as it ever was. Moving on to the next slide. Um, so at present, we have 1,649 homes on site at 14 locations across Northern Ireland, and that includes 490 in this council area. And the largest of those developments is at the H2 lands, where 421 new homes will be provided. And in terms of a deliverer across Northern Ireland, last year, Apex delivered 28% of the social housing development program um, across the whole of Northern Ireland. So you'll see that we are a key provider, not just in this council area, um, but right across um, the area. In terms of employment, moving on to the next slide, please. Um, Apex is also a key employer in the area. While at present 621 staff are employed by the organisation, 484 of those work in the council area, and that accounts for 78% of our staff team. So we, you will see from these headline statistics that Apex makes a significant contribution within this council area. Moving on to the next slide, please. So I'm going to focus on SCAG. Um, so you'll be aware that the SCAG development has been the largest social housing development in Northern Ireland um, in recent years. With construction commencing in 2015, and to date we have completed and handed over a total of 1,041 new homes in the area. The cost of delivery was £127.6 million, of which we received grant funding from government of £74.4 million, and the rest was contributed by Apex through private finance um, at a, an amount of £53.2 million. Moving on to the next slide. Um, so over the eight year period, um, we delivered those um, 1,041 homes across nine phases. And in regard to that, the bulk are two and three bedroom properties, um, of which 85% of the homes are uh, two and three bedroom. Moving on to the next slide. Um, so it's not just about the houses, it's about the community and the people that live there. And these new homes are providing much needed housing, but the development of a sustainable community is critical to the success of this significant new development. Some initial work um, carried out by ourselves provides information that we should all consider collectively to ensure that this new community is supported not solely through the provision of housing, but with the necessary infrastructure and support to enable it to th thrive. Some of the notable statistics included are that on average, 59% of households are headed by a single adult with children, 23% are children aged 11, 5 to 11 years, and on average, 93% of households are in receipt of benefits. Moving on to the next slide. 
So within those 1,041 homes, there's approximately 2,546 people living. And in regard to the age profile, 84% are under 40, 49% of those are under 18, and 36% are under 11. So it's really, really important that we invest not only in housing, but in the infrastructure. Moving on to the next slide, please. So within this community, um, there are wonderful new houses um, and the great potential in terms of building new communities, but there's also challenges. We have a con uh, concentration of tenants um, who came through with the highest housing need, um, all living in one community, and with that can bring social problems. We have a change in profile of new tenants. We were seeing increase in vulnerabilities, um, including uh, addiction and mental health issues. We're also seeing the requirement for housing, intensive housing management in terms of supporting the individuals um, to maintain their tenancy. And we're seeing an increase in complex antisocial behaviour complaints. And while those are caused by a small number of people, they have a much greater impact on the wider community. And that causes community and reputational damage, um, which does leave a legacy for the people that live there. And more recently as well, um, our tenants have also experienced the cost of living crisis and pressures on household budgets. So it is really important that we work not only to provide housing, but also to sustain these communities. So moving on to the next slide, please. How have we as APEX responded to that? Well, we have two key strategies, but it's not just what's written in the documents, it's what we actually deliver on the ground. So we have a tenant and resident engagement strategy where we seek to engage with our communities and establish what they need and what they want and how we can work with them to ensure that it's delivered. And we also have a community investment strategy. And on this slide, you'll see um, the Skag Community Hub, which um, sits at the heart of the community in Skag, where we work very closely with a number of partnership organisations. And there's a great deal of absolutely fantastic work um, that is being delivered there. And that proves to us as an organisation that we can't do it on our own. We need to work with the other organisations as well. And collectively, I think we can deliver more. In terms of our wider response within um, the Derry City and Strabane District Council area, if we move on to the next slide, you'll see some of the things that we do provide. So we have the SCA Community Hub, um, we have an allotments project in Craigan, we have the Apex Living Centre, which is based in Springtown, um, from which a community supermarket project is delivered. Um, we have the Foil Food Bank Partnership, and we also have training facilities down there for, for cookery classes. We've introduced a new approach to antisocial behaviour from October 2022, and we've introduced um, specialised housing officers trained in dealing with antisocial behaviour. And just to mention as well, we work closely with council in regard to the community warden service. We also were able to access funding for um, a tenancy support worker who's able to provide specialised support in the Skag area, and that's a three-year pilot um, that's being rolled out at the minute. So moving on to the next slide. So where to next for Apex? We're not standing still. Um, we know the level of housing need that is here in the city and right across Northern Ireland. So we are looking ahead, but focusing on what we're delivering um, within the council area. We have secured a pipeline of a further 1,350 homes um, within the council area with further phases planned at H2 on the Bunkrana Road and H1B lands, which were recently purchased. We anticipate that we'll see the delivery of some 800 homes at um, H2 the Cashel in the next 10 years. And we're currently on site with phase one for delivery of around 400 homes. We have also recently purchased lands at, at H1B and anticipate that this will deliver approximately 700 new homes with the site having outlined plan and permission at this stage. On to the next slide, please. And going forward, we're, we're very conscious of sustainability and our, our contribution in regard to that. So in June this year, we launched our first sustainability strategy. And this is an area where I feel that we can work closely with council, not just in the provision of housing and stable communities, but also how we do it and how we deliver. And finally, in, in summary, um, I believe that there are opportunities to work better together as there are many overlaps in what we're seeking to achieve. Um, we're the largest provider of new social housing in this council area. We're a key employer and investor. We want to build a strategic partnership between Apex and the council, and we would welcome the opportunity to collaborate more moving forward on matters such as planning, contributing to the local development plan, and delivering sustainable communities, supporting and maintaining local communities, looking at the green agenda, 
looking at community investor investment and being a contributor to the city deal and the strategic growth plan. Thank you. Thank you, Seamus and Sheena. Thank you for that presentation. I've got a couple indicated speakers. I just have two wee points I want to bring up myself. Just I'm going to be a wee bit sort of parochial <laughs> uh, in doing so, but um, I'm just conscious that it's, you know, even that presentation is the largest provider of new social housing. I would just like to delve a wee bit on the, how you support older properties and areas that you're, you know, that are under your responsibility. I know that Glenn Owen will be within the, the DEA that I represent. Um, and we had asked Apex to come to a task force meeting last week and yeah. nobody attended. So there, there was a wee bit of an issue there um, and it doesn't older. So I'm just conscious that the tenant and resident engagement strategy and the community investment strategy is something that's rolling out through for new communities. Yeah. But if we could delve into how um, that's being rolled out or should be being rolled out and the older areas. Yeah. Um, so that's just my wee points um, before we move forward. Uh, Councillor Farrell, you had indicated that you wanted to speak. Thanks, Chair, uh, and thanks, Sheena and Seamus, uh, for coming here today. Um, in October, we had the Chief Executive of the Housing Executive, along with the Regional Manager and the Area Manager, and we had a robust discussion about waiting lists across this city and district. Um, the five-year assessment, you know, the projected need for new houses um, across Derry and Saban is 4,070. Um, we currently have over 5,800 people on the waiting list waiting to be housed, and that doesn't include people who are in the transfer list. Uh, looking for more suitable accommodation. So, you know, I have a concern and we have a concern that you know, the projected need is not accurate. Um, there are nearly 6,000 people waiting at the moment and their projected need for the next five years is 4,000. You know, that, that doesn't tally with us. So, Seamus, you represent a host of housing associations that operate across this city and district. Um, what would your opinion be on the projected need? Do you think that 4,000 houses is enough to meet demand? I don't think it is. Um, so within you know, the housing association community across Derry and Strabane, have you had any discussions about the reality of the need on the ground? Because um, we are... Inundated and you know, inundated is used quite a lot in this chamber. But when somebody says they're inundated about housing, I believe them. Um, so it is the burning issue. There is a housing crisis. Um, we don't think four thousand over the next five years is going to put a dent in the waiting list because every projected need analysis over the last ten years has just led to growing housing needs, increased waiting lists. Um, <clears throat> And Sina, I've got a question and a comment for yourself as well. Uh, first of all, I'd like to say thank you to Apex for your efforts in building houses right across this city and district and building communities right across this city and district. And you know, I'm a councillor for Ballyarnett, as is Brian beside me. And if the thousand houses at Clonila, Clondara and Berraville weren't built, that housing list would be in far, far in excess of where it is today. So thank you for that. And I note um, the development plan that you currently have in place, you know, the 421 houses that are currently on site at H1B, H2, sorry. Uh, I know there are plans to build another 400 starting in 25, 26, and there's another 200 on Craigan Road as well. Um, what we'd obviously like you to build more. Um, so what, what are the barriers to building more? What can we as a council do to assist in that? And I know we have no Stormont at the minute. I know there is a housing supply strategy sitting somewhere in the ether. What barriers are you experiencing at Stormont? And I know finance is going to be a massive one, um, but what can we do at a local level? And what do you need decision makers at Stormont 
be it permanent secretaries, they do, they make life easier for yourselves, they deliver more homes. And I'm going to be very, very cheeky and ask something that's not about housing supply. Um, a kitchen replacement scheme at Cornshell Fields. It's been rumoured for quite a number of years. We're hearing that, that it may be programmed or it may be planned for 2024. Uh, could you give us any indication of will tenants in Cornshell Fields have new kitchens next year? Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Farrell. I suppose I'll go first, Sheena, just with the first um, point of the question. Um, on the need for the area, yeah, um, listen, we, we build, housing associations are dictated to where we build and the amount we build, we get approval from the department and the housing executive. And then allocations are determined as well, then we take who's allocated to us. So. Um, looking at the air, uh, looking at within the area here, I can see basically between Apex and Choice Housing. I know uh, this financial year, 24, 25, 26, 27, those two housing associations alone plan to build just over 1,600 homes in the Derry Straban area. Um, there's going to be an element when we look at the housing waiting list, there's always going to be people on the list who are never going to get enough points to get a property. So what what the department are trying to do as well, and in conjunction with councils here as well, you probably this discussion is try and come up with other housing models to where you can get the people at the bottom of the ladder onto some form of aff affordable housing through intermediate rent, um, through affordable homes for sale, and then the co-ownership model. Um, co-ownership model works. I think they helped house about 700 people last year who would never have a chance of getting on the property ladder otherwise. Intermediate rent and affordable homes for sale, they're brilliant in theory. They work brilliant, but, and this is the big but, is that housing associations cannot deliver them because of legislation and stormant. Um, housing, Apex cannot offer a private tenure. We'd love to be able to do it. I've had this uh, discussion with planners at several councils. And it's something where a lot of people thought initially intermediate rent we could deliver, but legislatively we can't. So that's going to take a, a change in legislation. I was at the All Party Working Group yesterday in Stormont where I met some of your party colleagues who are MLAs from the FOIL area here. Uh, and they agree basically there is a need for legislation change. And ideally we get a housing bill for Northern Ireland because we don't have one. Um, Scotland, England, Wales, the Republic of Ireland, all are progressing with progressive housing uh, legislation and initiatives and funding structures. We need that change, but also we need a multi-year budget because if we want to build enough homes, I've also said the problem is we suddenly got enough money to build 4,000 social homes next year. We couldn't do it because A, the land just isn't there ready to get. There's there's land banking problems, but also with the financing and the labour, you know, the construction sector have a labour shortage as well, the supply chain. So we probably need to gear up and that's why we're saying we need to do it incrementally to work our way up to getting those sufficient numbers. So my ask, I suppose, to council before, before I pass over to Sheena is really, you know, we obviously need legislative change. When you're talking about land availability in the area here, the biggest landowners um, in this area would be uh, the likes of TransLink and Northern Ireland Water. They have huge vast swathes of land that nothing's been built on. So it's about opening up those opportunities for the likes of Sheena and other associations to build on and then obviously open up the finance for that as well. Thank you. Um, just to go back to the Glen Owen query, and my apologies, um, I only picked up that there hadn't been attendance when we received a letter from Council um, earlier this week. So I have confirmed that the representative will be at the next meeting. Um, and in advance, I've asked for a schedule of what we had agreed that we would do um, and uh, to see where that's at at this point in time. Glen Owen is complicated because we only know, now own a small percentage of the properties, um, more than 70% are, are owner occupied, and that creates difficulties. And I know in the work that we've done to date, um, there are queries around who owns what um, and work ongoing with DFI. So we are committed to continue to work on that, um, and we will be at the meeting on the 18th with a clear update in, in regard to it. Um, in terms of housing executive and, and waiting lists and, and demand, um, in terms of going forward, we're very conscious of the demand in this area and we know how long people with the highest points sit on the waiting list even when they've got there in terms of waiting on a home and it is, it's unacceptable, none of us would want to be there. 
That's the reality of the situation that we're in. And we have sought to have an ongoing development programme here in the city and a pipeline for coming forward in, in regard to that. Um, and as I say, you know, right across Northern Ireland, we're de delivering 28% of um, the programme. But that need isn't going anywhere. It's, it's just going up. Um, so we are continuing to commit to that. Land availability and infrastructure are some of the key challenges that are there. Um, and as Seamus has mentioned as well, you know, we do rely on um, public funding. So we receive about just over 50 percent public funding and then we have to borrow the private finance as well so making sure that we are a good organization a sustainable organization in terms of being able to borrow money on the private market is really really important as well so our reputation what we deliver and and producing results is really important um so in regards to kitchen replacements and corn shell fields um i don't know the detail we have an asset management strategy which dictates the life cycle of what we replace within our existing stock as well as building new houses it's really important that we maintain our existing stock i don't know the detail of the program for 2024 but i can come back to you councillor way with details around that in terms of corn shell fields thank you Thank you, Sheena. I've got quite a number of indicated speakers, so I'm going to take them in groups of three just to allow a chance to respond for yourselves as well. Um, so, Councillor Duffy, you're online there. Thank you, Chair, for allowing me in. And thank you to Seamus and Sheena for coming along today. And I really do welcome the fact that you have come along and the work of housing, housing associations, particularly the scale of the builds um, that you are carrying out. Um, we are really grateful in terms of everything that housing associations do not just the building of houses the providing of um, social houses within this area but also i work in the homeless sector too so working alongside you as partners particularly apex um in terms of supported accommodation um homeless services and um, support services out in the community welfare advice that you provide out in the community and sheltered accommodation it's all really welcome the whole scale of the work that is carried out by housing associations. And I think that the partnership work that they do with the voluntary sector as well is absolutely second to none. Um, so I do thank you for that work. But I'm going to just sort of um, come into SCAG um, and Apex there. Uh, I also am a councillor for the Valley Arnott area. So SCAG would be within um, my remit. Um, now, absolutely, completely welcome um, the homes that have been built there. They are fantastic family homes. Uh, unfortunately, they haven't taken a huge dent out of the, the housing lists that we have. Um, we continue to see the housing crisis crunch down on people locally and the number of points that people need to, to get moved into one of those homes has just become absolutely extortionate. Um, I have also had party colleagues come down from North Belfast who have expressed sheer jealousy in terms of the scale of the build around Skeg. Um, but unfortunately as well, as you have alluded to, um, Sheena, because of the scale of the build, because of the scale of the points, um, we have seen huge issues um, that sometimes flare up around the, the estate in itself. We have seen residents report issues around antisocial behaviour, criminal behaviour. Um, there's been issues around drug paraphernalia being found in some of the play parks. We have had a number of residents meetings um, around some of this stuff and I really welcome the work that's going on. Um, I know Nave in terms of the antisocial behaviour officer has been doing tremendous work as have the other housing, uh, housing officers, um, your tenancy support worker, and you know there's just been a huge amount of work going into the area to try and address some of the issues but sometimes what we have found is communication can be an issue in terms of making sure that residents are properly communicated with that they know what's going on that their housing officers are responding to um the queries requests that they're putting in and it's unfortunate as well that we see the people who have fought really hard um, to get a family home within the Skeg area, but then within very short periods of time are putting in then for management transfers due to some of the issues that they feel that aren't getting addressed within the area. But I don't believe that any of the housing officers or any of the people who are working on the ground aren't doing their job. I just believe that they're really stretched. Um, because of the high concentration of people living within the area with the issues. And I suppose my question around that is, 
do we need to look at bringing in other people? Do we need to look at further partnerships um, within the area? Because we talk about building communities, and I have to say, um, I'll, I'll declare an interest in terms of the Skate Community Hub as a director on GSAP. The work of the hub is absolutely fantastic, but I think that maybe there, there's other voluntary sector partners that we could bring in around supporting some of our most vulnerable people within the community to make sure that they're getting the support that they need to maintain the tenancies there because we do want to build those really strong communities and make Skeg a fantastic place to live. Um, so I, I, that's probably a question around that in terms of do we have enough staff covering that and do we need to look at partnerships just to ensure that our strategies are working right. And then I know that um, Emma touched on it there in terms of repairs of older properties and um, Councillor Farrell touched on it in terms of corn shell. But we do get complaints at times around some of the, the homes that housing associations own through that are speckled throughout communities um, in terms of repairs. And maybe they're not up to standard. Maybe there's issues around damp or mold within those properties and just trying to get some of those issues addressed. I know we have an issue in terms of tradespeople and getting people in to do work, but we don't want people living in properties um, where there is repairs needed and they may have a, an impact on their health. But overall, I have to say the work of um, housing associations is second to none. I have great working relationships right throughout the mall, and I really do welcome as well the development of the H2 lands. It's something that we have fought for very long within this council area and there has been a number of blockages over the years uh, but finally we're going to see some development on it so i really welcome that um we we i think she you mentioned it there in terms of um the need for building more homes and none of us will argue with that minister hargy um uh, before leaving office um had set out a really ambitious house building plan um, but unfortunately, to see that come to any sort of fruition, we need the executive backup. Um, we need multi-year budgets, um, and that's how, the only way that we're going to be able to, in any way, properly address the housing crisis that we see. But I thank you for coming in, and I thank you for your time today. So thank you. Thank you, Councillor Duffy. Councillor Heaney. Thanks, Chair, and thanks to Seamus and Sheena for coming in. And as they say again, Seamus, both you and I in different roles. Um, my sort of comment more than a question will follow on quite appropriately uh, the, the comments that Councillor Duffy raised there. Um, so, like the H2 development is um, a very welcome development in my DEA. Uh, these bad needed homes um, will be a great asset, and, and we uh, are grateful that, that that huge development is is underway. But you know, learning from the lessons of Skeg, uh, like what we we want to see a vibrant community in these new homes, not just houses. We want to see services, uh, facilities. Uh, I welcome the the investments that you did put on the Skeg to try and, and and do that, and the you know, anti-social uh, officers that that are there because we would anticipate. Uh, just looking at the experience of Skeg, that uh, that similar um, similar things may well happen in, in these new communities as, as they spring up. Uh, so, if we can get ahead of that problem as much as possible and work with the local reps, I know there is a number of steering groups in place to try and, and steer that development to be the best it can be, uh, and design out as much of potential problems um, as as we can. But just following on from what Councillor Duffy said, like if, if even in terms of the Skeg area at present, uh, the current amount of officers are, are stretched their limits, then adding in hundreds and hundreds of new homes um, over the next mile would, would be worrying that uh, there won't be the capacity there to, to have the personnel to sort of address all those issues. So it's something just to alert you to and work with us on. We'd certainly work with you. Um, as these homes begin to be constructed and, and people begin to be allocated them. Uh, so it's really that comment and just look, looking forward and, uh, and, and doing it and, and working constructively in the time ahead. So thank you for coming. Thank you, Councillor Heaney. Councillor Tierney, I'm going to bring you on and then I'm going to come back to Seamus and Sheena and then I have three more indicated speakers after that. Thank you, Chair. Uh, and thanks to Seamus and Sheena for, for coming on. Um, 
But before I start, I'll declare an interest as a member of uh, the Greater Chantal Area Partnership, um, who are obviously partners with uh, Apex and the, the Ski Club. Um, Seamus, when, when you were speaking, um, you made reference um, on several occasions to the budget. Um, and from what I have picked up um, from what you were saying, DFC have cut the budget to build new homes. Um, could you maybe elaborate on that in a wee, a wee bit? Tell us when that decision was taken and by how much that budget was cut. Um, because I think that's an important statistic for across the north, but particularly um, for the city and district where we, I think every housing provider um, and everybody who knows a little bit about housing knows that this city and district has, a, has right now and has always had a housing crisis um, for as long far back as most of us um, clearly remember. Um, Sheena, I'm also going to declare an interest as a, as a Ballyarnott councillor. Um, on one of your slides, um, you talked about community and reputational damage impact. Um, and I remember Skeg when the road ended just past Fern Abbey um, and there was nothing but fields that led you onto the Bunker Road. Road. Um, there was no industrial estate, um, there was no nothing. Um, and when you look at it now, I think it's absolutely fantastic um, that what's going on out there. Um, and I know that in some instances, um, and I know Councillor Duffy touched on, on, on some of them, um, and I'm aware of them too, um, and do be contacted by people who are experiencing antisocial behaviour uh, in either Clondara, Clonilic, or, or Berevay. But Skeg is a lovely place to live. Um, there is fantastic work going, out, going on out there, and I know many people um, who, who live out there and thankfully have been in a position to support many people to be housed out there. Um, but it's a fantastic place to live, and there's lots and lots going on. Um, and I think that the hub is only really getting going. I think there's so much more potential um, for the hub. They do fantastic work already, but I think there's so much more potential if they had the proper facilities. Um, now, they do have a facility there, and it's, it's welcome. But if we're being honest, it is outgrown um, its need now at the moment, um, and they're you will be aware of the conversations around peace flow, peace plus applications, et cetera, et cetera. I think that's a massive indicator of the work that the, that the community workers are doing there um, shows that there is a need um, and there is an appetite for the residents out there to be engaging um, in, their, in their community. But they can't do that if they're being shut out because they don't have big enough facilities to, to cater for people. And I think that's something that needs looked at. Um, I, I, I genuinely do. I do uh, also... Um, acknowledge and i think it's, it's it's worth acknowledging the contribution that apex staff make to the outer north community safety team um, because apex are a major um, player in house, providing housing within the ballyarnett da with across the city district as your as your slides point out but within the ballyarnett da because we have got ski um they are a, a major player um and you know i could rhyme off members of staff who regularly attend. I don't want to in case I leave someone out. Um, but they are always there. They're always willing um, to put their shoulder to the wheel to address issues um, and, and, and to have um, conversations around that. And they're always engaging for support where they can provide services from other community organizations, community organizations. And I think that's, that's definitely welcome. Um, you talked about the tenants the tenant residence engagement strategy. I think that's a massive um, positive for people in Skeg um, because there were issues and Councillor Duffy touched on communication, people receiving updates and, and all of that there. I think part of that has been addressed through the, the tenant engagement strategy. It could be better, uh, you know, nothing's perfect. It could be better, but at least I think from, from our point of view, we notice and recognize that Apex have noticed and recognized that there was a slight issue and have taken steps to address it. I think that resonance strategy um, and the engagement that residents have out there will only grow um, in the coming months and, and, and years. And I think, you know, I know some of the people who attend it. I know many of the residents in Skeg, they're never found wanting whenever they, they, they want to make sure that someone hears their voice. And I think that's a perfect avenue for them to be able to do it. Um, Mr. Duffy talked about having colleagues in from North Belfast down. I remember uh, bringing when Simon Coveney visited 
uh, Skeg whenever he was housing minister, um, and he was blown away um, by the standard and the quality of houses that were being provided. Um, and I think Skeg, if you look at every every development out there, the houses have got a better standard each time, and I think that's welcome as well. And the people out there are, in my opinion, incredibly lucky um, to, be, to be to be housed out there. That leads me on to the, to the development of Hitch 2. That's most likely only going to be better. Um, but the important thing around it is um, myself and former Councillor Tony Hassan, at the time of Skeg, were very clear around the need to build a community, not just to build houses, to build a community. When you look at what's out of Skeg, with lunches, with the, the new dominoes, etc., etc., you can see the bones of a community starting to be, to, to be built, but there needs to be more community facilities, which leads me back to the, to the youth provision um, down at the hub and, and all of that there. They're doing fantastic work, but they need support. And that's where I think you come in and play a major role. And from our point of view, and hopefully from this Council's point of view, if you need support to provide that support, we'll certainly not be found wanting and trying to do it. But as others have said, look, I think Skeg is a fantastic development, and I look forward to seeing developments roll out um, across uh, this council district. I dread to think if it wasn't for housing associations like Apex, where the housing crisis in the city and district would be, um, and where and the conditions that people would be living in. Um, so, from our point of view, thanks very much for for all you do. Keep up the good work, and if there's anything that we can do, please don't hesitate to get in touch. Thank you. I'll just pass back to yourself to respond to the comments that have been made so far. And thanks very much. Um, I suppose I'll just touch, I suppose, uh, Councillor Heaney, um, you talked about obviously the, the appropriate infrastructure um, and place we're building new developments, and that's quite right. I think, you know, Councillor Tierney touched on it as well. Um, we also have to remember about new developments about um, inner city, urban um, infrastructure as well. Um, I know basically, I know Apex, I know Clan Mill and Ark are all building, uh, and currently a stone's throw here from the Guildhall doing around Waterloo and places. And I think Derry City is following, um, you know, it, it's it, it's it's a trend right across Europe at the moment now is uh, uh, living above shops, cafes, et cetera, get more people living in urban areas, get a bit of vibrancy. So we need to think about the infrastructure about that in those towns and city centres. Things like, you know, people talk about if we're going to put people into a certain part of the city, we've got to make sure that there's, you know, childcare, GP surgeries, everything's within such a distance really of where the people live because what we don't want is move hundreds of people into the middle of a city and then commuting out the way in the mornings. Um, going to Brian Tierney's um, comment there really about the budget. So the, the budget, this will relate back to the Secretary of State in April with the cuts imposed on, on the Stormont budget. So in April, um, there was £861 million allocated to the Department for Communities from Treasury. That was a £111 million shortfall in what they asked for. Just to just to break even on that, and then the capital budget. So the capital budget for the department for communities to fund the building of homes, that was subsequently cut. That was a shortfall of fifty nine million pounds, which is is a, a shortfall of basically um, twenty seven percent of what we needed. We seen at the time prior to April. Um, NIFA actually publicly, I actually wrote to the Secretary of State and requested a minimum, we needed a 10% increase in the social housing development program if we wanted to try and make a dent on the waiting list. But uh, the response was basically a 27% cut in that budget. So you can see the difficulty where it lies. Um, so, Councillor Duffy, in regard to communication, um, absolutely, there's always lessons to be learned. And if you don't get the response from the individual with an apex that you're dealing with, please come back to us and, and um, feed it in and, and feed it up the line. And we are learning lessons from Skag. Skag has been our biggest development as an organisation. Um, and we are already looking, you know, we're looking at the housing mix, we're looking at the community infrastructure. Um, we've actually met with Council recently, and those discussions are continuing. Um, I, Within the last week, I've been speaking to the housing executive in terms of what can we do better? Because even as we bring on um, the H1B lands, 
we have outgrown this gay community hub, but there is fantastic work that is going on down there. Um, but we, as an organisation, don't necessarily have everything in terms of delivering what's needed. So it is really, really important that we work in, in partnership as, as we go forward. Um, in regard to the older properties as well, I do take your point and we do need to continue um, to, to work in terms of ensuring that the standard of our older properties is maintained. Damp and Mould has had a massive focus over the last year. Um, and we as an organisation have thrown a completely different light on it, even taking it beyond just a maintenance issue. It's about lifestyle, the way people live, it's about poverty. Um, so we're looking at that in the round, not only how we resolve the issue with the damp and mould, but also how we support the individual that's living in, in that home. Um, so there's a lot of work going on around that. So again, if there are issues, please bring them to us. And if you don't get a satisfactory response at the first point, raise it further up, up the line um, in relation to that. Councillor Heaney, in regard to the learning from SCAG, as I've mentioned, we are, we're looking now at H2 um, in terms of what can be delivered there. We're also looking, you know, at, at broader than just the housing piece. So what lands we've come up against challenges and in, in SCAG, we're sitting there with the community helping a piece of land right beside it that the community are crying out for. We've been working very closely with GSAP in terms of saying, well, what more could be done even on a temporary basis in regard to that? And I think that's where we have to have further discussions because you're right it's not just about delivering houses and especially when you look at the number of houses that are being provided it's really really important that the infrastructure is there and when you look at the statistics around the number of single parent households the number of people on benefits and the number of young people in those communities it's really really important that we look at the bigger picture um, in relation to that um, and in, in terms of the budget cut, we are committed to this community and the city in, in terms of development. Um, this is where our roots are. Um, so we are com uh, committed and I think the pipeline demonstrates that. But as we say, we are a land and government as well for part of that funding. Um, and, and we will continue to press in, in relation to that as we go forward. And we do. We ha have as an organisation probably for the last 15 to 20 years, recognise that we can't do it on our own and our funding from our tenants' rent can solely deliver everything that communities need. So we have worked very much in partnership with the organisations that are on the ground, seeking to build those relationships at the very, very early stage before we even get on the ground in, in terms of building the properties and seeing what's there, not trying to reinvent the wheel, not trying to do it ourselves because we know the people out there are better informed and, and closer um, to our tenants in, in regard to that. And we have used the opportunity to apply for external funding, Peace Plus, um, previously Ireland funding, whenever it was there. We're also able to access, and, and we're able to access it in terms of our new scheme at Culmore, um, TBOC funding, which we can use within a five mile radius. So reaching out into the broader community as well. So all of that, we're really, really committed to as we go forward. Thank you, Sheila. Um, Councillor O'Farrell. Carmilla Maugera, Cahirly, thank you very much. Uh, listen, Sheena, uh, I spoke to you before in Savannah, the meeting to do with housing as well, and thank you very much, Seamus, as well. But uh, we're talking more, mainly here about uh, urban uh, social housing. Uh, I want to know more about uh, rural housing. Now, I'm, uh, I'm based in Cyan Mills, and we have a couple of projects going at the minute, thank God. But, um, I see the thing about land as well. Do you use bank land? Do you use buy land? No. Uh, no. Uh, I'm at Sam Mills, as I say, but in the Glebe and Clary and Newton, or sorry, uh, Victoria Bridge, Castle Derrick areas, have you earmarked any uh, land there to develop? Um, the reason I'm saying is that there's communities up there and uh, schools are not are failing. We need to build up the social housing in the areas. Now, I have to say, but before going any further, I am a huge fan of social housing. I'm a big fan of Apex and all the other groups as well, because I was reared in social housing myself, you know. So, um, if you can answer those questions about the rural uh, development side of it. Yeah. Um we build on any community. So if there's a housing need, we will look at the housing need. And if we can source land and there's infrastructure there, we will deliver. Um, and, and that's regardless of, of the broader area. Sorry, I can get your director. <laughs> Um, so we have no plans in your area at the moment. And I think we discussed that at the meeting. But what we said is if, if there is if there is, if you have a site identified, we will consider it. We require the support of the housing executive in terms of housing need. But if that all stacks up, we will work with an any community. 
Councillor Farrell was off. I just mentioned so I, I raised this very point with the housing executive at a recent meeting. They had a target of the new builds uh, for last year. In total, they had targeted a minimum 12% of all new social homes to be in rural areas. Subsequently, it worked out, I can't remember exactly, but it's roughly maybe about six or seven percent of new builds actually were in rural areas. When I inquired um, about that, it came down to land availability, a lot of it, uh, and some controls around planning. Um, I also had that discussion, I met with Causeway Coast uh, and Glens Council, um, because they have a need, as obviously, in their area, and it came down again to land availability. And it goes back to what I raised earlier, um, Northern Ireland Water, of large amounts of money um, in rural areas. So if you if you ever have the opportunity to speak to them, that's an opportunity maybe that they could assist with as well. Thank you. Um, Councillor Jackson, and then I'm going to bring on Councillor Donnelly after that. Um, thanks, Chair. And again, just um, to echo the thanks from everybody throughout the chamber in relation to the work of all the housing associations. Um, and you know, I know in relation to your report, um, there's there was a focus on on the H two lands and the H one B lands, and I can understand that there, that's that's where the large land zonings are um, in the dairy area plan. And I know that all housing associations, in particular Apex, have a track record in delivering housing. Um, in our areas, you know, and, and I'm particularly um, encouraged by the the, the the willingness to for Apex in particular to, to form a strategic partnership with council um, because we've got we've had other examples. You know, Anton um, referenced the need for housing in rural areas. There's a huge need for housing right across our city and district, and um, we've seen we've seen examples in the watershed in particular. There's examples. Browns, our development opportunities became available um, in Duke Street, in Spencer Road, in Edmonton School, um, and the St. Bregan site. And I know, uh, in particular in relation to St. Bregan's Park, I want to I commend Apex for, I know there was frustrations around the delays, but um, I want to commend the efforts to get ensure that most of that the majority of the applications have been done before Christmas. It's been really welcome news. Um but and it, the demand it demonstrates the the success of the previous phase. So hopefully we're going to see further development opportunities and, and I, I would be keen for all housing associations to develop that partnership with council. Um, they try and identify further opportunities because housing is there's a massive crisis. Crisis. You don't need us to tell you that, um, and we want to work collaboratively to try and find a solution um, right across our city and district. I understand the focus on H one B and H two, um, but there's other opportunities and needs right across. Um, I know, Seamus, in relation to I know we. I would be keen to have a conversation with you um, offline because whilst we see the fantastic work um, and emphasis in the city from the, or from housing associations such as Apex, um, there's other housing associations that don't that have the same roots within the city and district um, that we don't receive the same level of attention or focus from um, and or and particularly responses. Uh, and we will be looking because we want we want more people to be looking towards the northwest. They they be anybody that, that can play a part. They address the need. They have a role to play. Um, to do that, there needs to be trust and confidence. Um, and at this moment in time, there's some housing associations where there's very little trust and confidence. Um, and I'm I'm not, not I'm certainly not referencing Apex in relation to that, but I would be keen to have a conversation to see, with the offline to see if there's if what, what what we can do to try and build those relationships again. But I, I'm I'm really really keen to see that strategic partnership with council. Um, they try and identify further development sites, um, and uh, and try and work collaboratively. The the mega dent and the huge witness that we're we're seeing growing every day. Thanks, Chair. Thank you, Councillor Donnelly. 
Garmelga Chair, and thank you for the presentation today, and you're very welcome. Look, uh, I, in my opinion is, and I want to declare an interest, I, I currently live in a housing executive property, I'm renting it, I've done for, for uh, a number of years. But, you know, in my opinion, I think that the people who should be building social housing should be the, the housing executive. But given the dysfunctional nature of, of the state here, that doesn't happen. Uh, therefore, you know, I welcome it when, when, when housing associations build and, you know, even developers. It's not my choice, but I don't make the rules. But I don't think, well, I speak for myself, I don't believe that the service is the same, you know, uh, for a number of reasons that, that we don't have the same accountability from housing associations that you would have from the the housing executive and the rents are are more generally more expensive uh we have some very very you know and it's been touched at here uh by a number of councillors some of these housing associations in particular uh the behavior of triangle recently was absolutely abhorrent uh complete disregard for for you know both their their tenants and the, the, the community around them. Uh, now, I do have to say there is aspects of, of, of Apex too, and Apex, in my opinion, are one of the better housing associations. And, the, you know, there is a lot of, you know, really, really good housing in this city and district due to Apex. Uh, you know, I was in the ones in Woodland, uh, Woodlands, uh, on the Guard recently, and they're t absolutely top notch. But I do believe that the service from Apex is not, in my opinion, you know, at all times satis satisfactorily. Uh, you know, housing associations aren't subject to FOIs, which I think that can be very important for, particularly for elected reps like myself, when you're trying to get to the, the, the bottom of, of something, you know. Uh, but there has been a number of cases where I believe the service from the like Apex, one was you know, recently a young mower had an offer withdrawn, and I believe that that mower was, uh, you know, uh, she was a victim in all this, and there was coercive control involved. And when I outlined that on a Wednesday, and told them that I could supply proof, twenty four hours later the offer was withdrawn, and and the appeals mechanism was that she could make a complaint. Now that doesn't sit very comfortable with me given that, you know, what I believe coercive control is a very, very serious issue. I've also had other tenants who felt threatened and bullied in their own home by somebody, not particularly directly by Apex employees, but somebody that Apex had had employed. And in that case, I don't believe, you know, they stepped up to the mark and dealt with the, the, the issue uh, properly. Another issue that I would have, and, I, and this isn't pick this may sound like, but you know, Apex is here and as I said, I think that they've supplied, you know, I've I've had dozens and dozens of people help dozens and dozens of people who who are now living very happily in Apex properties. But the you know the fact that Apex uh would oppose debt relief orders is is a, is is doesn't sit easy with me considering that their connection with the like of the food bank. You know, so if there's anything that that you know I think when we talk about partnerships, I think that housing associations need to improve their connection or their partnerships with elected representatives. You know, so you know, in, in order so that we can we 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 can move forward, uh, there is rumours of Apex. You know, are going to be building large numbers of homes in and around you know Craigan area, and I hope that that is true because as any of our elected rep will tell you, you know, the amount of people that we're dealing with in a on a daily basis and some of the horrific stories that we're hearing from people who don't have a home, you know, it sort of drives us. We have a bit of passion for that. So if there's anything that can be done to, to, to you know, improve uh, more communication, as has been outlined by, by a number of elected reps before me, then it would be very welcome. And thank you. Thank you, Councillor Danley. Alderman Hussey and then Councillor Tierney said he had a really small question to ask. So I'm going to allow him to have his wee small question um, and then I'll come back to yourselves. And that's everybody that's on the list at this stage. Thanks. Uh, thank you, Seamus and Sheena, for the presentations. And uh, I may follow on from Councillor Farrell there and some of his rural issues, but go back to the presentation which concentrated on scare and I'm looking at a post-war development, namely Seacroft and Leeds, which many, many people know. 
and there's been a case study in many areas of human activity, uh, including sociological and planning issues. And when I looked at your list of challenges, I thought on some of the stuff that, that I would have looked at uh, when studying sociology. Uh, and those challenges, the challenges that I seen when I was looking at the case study of Seacroft, were lessons not learned with regard to these large scale developments of that nature. Uh, I grew up like like others in this chamber uh, on a council estate, a small compact housing estate, which became a community, becomes a community far, far quicker. Um, so I'm wondering to myself, is it the housing supply unit at DFC who are determining what you can do? Or is that, is that your choice? And I suppose this is to Apex, that this is the way uh, you would develop. Um, you know, the, the grant is approximately, what, 60% of your funding, so obviously it has, has quite a, an influence. So I'm wondering where, is there an influence, or was that your determination that that is the way you would take housing supply in the city of London Dairy forward? Um, the types of build, I, I imagine, or I would hope, will reflect that new tenant uh, makeup uh, diagram that we have. I presume they reflect that. Uh, I would hope they do because one of one of the issues uh, that I'm coming across in the rural area is matching the housing stock to the housing requirement, um, and that brings me on then to Councillor Farrell's issue of we heard a lot about urban housing, and I suppose maybe Seamus this goes back to you because I, I imagine Apex seemed to be developing out of the was the Dairy Housing Association or whatever it was, so it's pretty much city, and I look at the, the staff con content there as well. So it's it's a question for all uh, housing associations. You know, I'd like to hear more about the rural provision. And it worries me uh, when there's this concentration on urban housing. Is it a case of trying to corral people into the settlements rather than allowing smaller scale development throughout our rural community? and uh, maintaining the communities, not building a community, but maintaining the communities that are already there through their local churches, their sports clubs, and, and, and all of that activity. Uh, and then again, that's a question for planners as well. <laughs> what are they going to allow? Uh, but, but my questions are, are, are very general, uh, as you'll gather, but uh, like Councillor Ford, I have the, the rural concern that is my major concern. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Alderman Hussey. Councillor Tierney, do you want to go ahead and then might I pass back to Sheena and Seamus? Thank you, Chair. And it's really just a, a, a quick point. Um, Sheena, you'll be aware of discussions within this council around Balnagard. Um, and thankfully, we were able to take steps to, 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 to get that resolved. I'm just wondering, have all of those people who were allocated, who were given allocated houses, been given keys and moving in dates? I think I know the answer, but I want you to tell me it. Thank you. Sir Tierney, I'll start with your query. Um, there's two properties that there's a question mark over. Um, there's not offers out against them at the minute. There were offers out against them, but they're not there at this point in time. It's being considered by our board tomorrow night, and that's around the breach of planning. And we are answerable to our regulators. Um, we have sought assurance um, in regard to that. Um, it's still a breach of planning um, and the consideration of when um, the facilities will be delivered. We're seeking, we're in discussions with council around that at this point in time. So there is still a query over two properties, but in regard to the rest of the properties, my understanding is that, that everybody has been confirmed their date. And I think tomorrow is the handover of the, the final keys in, in regard to them. So we're working through that issue at the minute. Um, Councillor Hussey, I hear what you're saying in, in regards to building large scale developments. And we have had a commitment over the years. It, our organisation has been going for more than 50 years. And we we do build in small rural communities. We have built in Castle Derg. We have rural bungalows scattered throughout Tyrone um, and, and areas like that. So we do respond on the basis of need. Um, I suppose I picked Skag because it's been the largest development in this area and there is a huge demand for housing and it's been a response to that. Um, but we will consider whatever comes our way 
way and if there is a need and there is um, land available, um, there is planning and, and everything stacks up, we will look at, at providing um, to meet that need. Um, in regards to um, Councillor Donnelly, Councillor Donnelly, I, I accept that there are times when, when things go wrong and we don't always get things 100% right. But where we do get it wrong, please come back and talk to us and we will see what we can do to try and get an, an end outcome. And, and you've referred to a couple of specific cases and it wouldn't be right to comment on them in the chamber, I think, at this point in time. But I'm happy to pick those up um, afterwards um, in, in regards to the concerns that have been raised. I'll just come back on a couple of things. I'll just start with um, Councillor Jackson there. Listen, yeah, that'd be good. If you, if you want to reach out, the, the committee has my contact details and I'll help you put together maybe a little meeting with some housing associations, see how we can work even more closely in the area. Um, like I said, you know, we've got nine housing associations here in the area, um, active um, building and managing properties, but let's see how we can strengthen that as well going forward. Um, on Councillor Don Donnelly's point, really, with regards to the, the difference um, in rents between um, housing executive and housing associations, I suppose I would just um, point out, really, a housing executive haven't built houses in plus 25 years, roughly. Um, so those houses have paid for themselves. There's no, if you imagine, there's no mortgage to pay there on those. Um, with housing associations, there's bank loans to pay back there. Um, so we have to be realistic. So you're, they're modern homes um, that have to be maintained, but also there's loans there as well to pay back as well. So that's, we have to draw the comparison there as well. Um, with regards to the, he pointed out as well about um, uh, incidents with uh, domestic violence and things like that. There's currently underway, there's a fundamental review of allocation. So how you get on the waiting list and how many points you get as determined by points as well. So that's something the department is looking at. It was being looked at before the executive um, um, fell by the wayside there a couple of years ago. So hopefully we can get that reevaluated again, because I do agree, I, I get correspondences from people, victims of domestic um, violence, who get lesser points than people who get points from intimidation points, for example. And that's something we need to look at, really, to make sure it's fair and reflective. And then on Alderman Hussey's points as well, um, I think, yeah, rural housing, we did have rural housing week, we had a campaign with the housing executive recently, and uh, obviously one of our members there would be the Rural Housing Association or headquartered in Noma there. Um, one of the things, yeah, they would always say, you know, like... It, it's it's getting the land in the areas first of all. It's the economies of scale of building in those areas, and I, it's something NIF is really um, supportive of because we make the point when we're speaking to planners, communities, etc. You know, by getting social housing into an area, it's going to sustain the local post office, the local primary school, things, all those little public services that if you don't get new people moving into that rural area, they're at risk of losing them forever then. So that's something, anything we can do to help rural housing, we'll, cert we'll certainly do and, and reach out to us as well if, if, you, if you can. So thank you. It's perfect. Thank you, Seamus and Sheena. I know that, that those were all in response. Is there any closing remarks that you'd like to make just before we move forward he's happy enough that presented which i'll just um say thank you just um once again really and you know the, the last thing really is just coming down to, to planning you know and obviously we had a very sympathetic year you realize that there is a housing crisis there planning is one of those things that you know are slow down the mechanism of delivering houses on the ground but also when you're talking to the Department for Infrastructure and Northern Ireland Water, getting those connections, um, sometimes that can slow down the process of wastewater, freshwater um, and roads access to sites can be very tiresome for a lot of associates and, and, and it leads to a longer time frame of delivery on the ground. And for me, um, just thanks once again. As a, as a native from Bunkrana, I've walked past the Guild Hall for d d numerous times and I've never been in the Guild Hall before. So uh, it was impressive to be here today. So thank you for your time. Thank you. And I would just like to say thanks as well. It's my first time at Council um, and hopefully it's not my last. And I hope that Apex continues to deliver for the communities here um, in the Council area, both rural um, and city. Um, and again, I'm a native of the city, so um, it's not just about building housing, it's about building communities. And I look forward to working with the Council in, in partnership in terms of doing that. Thank you. Great, thank you very much. Thank you.
All right, folks. Um, item seven is chairperson's business, and I have none, so we'll move on from that. I'm conscious of the time. Do you just want to keep going through, or I'll just get a view from members just fire on through, or do you just want to take a break? Go ahead. Okay. Um, so item eight is matters arising from the Open Minister of Governance and Strategic Planning held on Tuesday the 7th of November. Are there any matters arising from last month's meeting? No. Okay. Um, item nine is the local sorry, government. Chair. Model. Sorry, Paul. Yeah, sorry, I had chat box there, Chair. That's not shown on the site here, but go ahead. Sorry, I sent it to the private chair and Manager Council. Sorry, um, just two items, Chair GSP uh, one six two slash two three, just for accuracy. And um, it says that I'm a board member of the Education Authority. It was just that I was an employee of the Education Authority rather than a board member. Um, and then the second item, Chair, if you don't mind, is GSP one seven nine two three. Um, and it's just in relation to that we really send a letter off to the Department for Education in relation to the SEND deputation. Um, I see in a later item that it has moved from April to March. I'm just wondering, was that as a result of that letter? Um, and again, just to reiterate um, the points that I made the last time, is that the air list um, that the department can come on this? Or is that the air list that as a committee we can we can take them? Thanks, Chair. Through you, Chair. I'm just checking with Rachel at the back of the room. I think she's confirming it is, is the earliest they can come in. Is that right? Okay, so Councillor Boggs, we did follow up after the last meeting and um, they're changing directors, and that's the earliest that the new director can come in. Is that okay? Yeah, content with that. Thanks, Chair. Thanks, John. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Boggs. Any further matters raising? No. Nope. Okay, so um, item nine is the local government model complaints handling procedure, and that's Ellen, am I right saying? Yep. Yes, um, through you, Chair. Um, purpose of this report is to advise elected members of the Northern Ireland Public Services Ombudsman publication on a local government model complaints handling procedure, which is, was presented in your papers as Appendix 1, and also to seek approval for an updated complaints handle, handling policy and procedures for this Council to reflect that new approach. Um, as, it, as indicated in the report and, and by way of background, the Public Services Ombudsman Act now has uh, permitted or encouraged the NIPSO to publish model complaints handling procedures for public bodies within the jurisdiction and the local government uh, model scheme was developed in partnership with a network of local government staff and was published on the 1st of July. Um, this approach is obviously being um, rolled out across all of the public sector with an aim of giving uh, a standardised and consistent approach and process for customers to follow, uh, making it easier to complain, uh, encourage greater confidence in the process, and also to make sure the public bodies learn from the, the, the experiences of complaints. Um, it's all public bodies ultimately will, will be required to implement a, a complaint handling procedure whenever their organisation's scheme is published. But certainly, as I say, um, as indicated in the report, this scheme will be taken forward by ourselves with an implementation date of the 1st of January. Um, in terms of the, the standards, as, as I say, um, and the key principles that are set out in the documentation. Uh, it's all about early resolution of complaints and promoting the use of complaints information for learning and improvement. And the principles set out in the, in the model scheme are really around uh, starting off right, fixing it early, focusing on what matters, being fair, being honest, and learning to improve. Um, Accordingly, in terms of the key issues, um, we have updated our documentation to reflect the scheme, including, uh, I should note, uh, in order to be uh, compliant with the scheme, there are a number of items at 3.2, which we cannot deviate from, and that's around the definition of a complaint, the number of stages, the time scales at each stage, a requirement to record, report and publicise pu uh, complaints information, um, also to learn from complaints, ensure that information 
is publicised in terms of how to complain and also the provision of support and removing any barriers to anyone complaining. Um, the primary uh, changes that we would also see in terms of, of from what we currently have in place are around the fact that we currently have a three-stage process and a new scheme uh, promotes a, a two-stage process. So obviously what we've been doing is we've been reviewing our policy and guidance um, in terms of the new approach to complaints handling. Um, we're updating forms or website we're looking at our logging and reporting systems and we'll also be undertaking uh, in, in December a number of training sessions, again, um, to bring staff up to get to date with the new processes and procedures, but also to make probably, you know, as I say, build in a new culture of of, of delivering complaints handling in this context. Um, the recommendation in front of members today is again subject to your comments that you note the publication by NIPSO and also you approve the updated complaints handling policy and procedures set out in appendix two. Thank you, members. Thank you, Ellen. Does any member wish to speak on this item? Councillor Heaney? Something just happy to propose. Okay. Happy to second and thank officers for the work on it. Thank you. Okay. Items 10 to item 13 are all open for information. Is there any item that members wish to speak on? Steve opportunity. We're happy enough. Okay. Can I get a proposer for confidential and a seconder, please? Okay. Councillor Farrell and Councillor Jackson, let's give it a wee second to go on to confidential. Okay. 